All right, so this is our fifth webinar. Uh, last uh, Sunday, uh, Professor uh, uh, Peter Stilwell from Canada and Matt Lowe, a, uh, uh, two of the brightest minds in chiropractic and physical therapy, uh, Matt Lowe from England, uh, physio, and Peter Stilwell, a uh, chiropractor from Canada, joined us for a very deep dive into uh, new ways of framing uh, the person-centered approach, uh, pivoting away from dichotomizing pain science and biomechanics or biomedical issues, even trying to avoid trichotomization and seeing that this is more of a spectrum and getting to know our patients a little bit better, which is something which uh, ironically, uh, ironically seems to be even easier in telehealth where we have blinders on, we're like a horse coming out of the gate. Um, and maybe it's helping knowledge translation, something that's been really slow as we try to disseminate evidence-based best practices uh, for over 30 years unsuccessfully. Um, uh, it appears knowledge translation is accelerating as an unintended consequence or benefit of this COVID virus. So I just want to welcome people from all over the world. Uh, I know uh, Michelle Erickson from Sydney is here. We have lots of Aussies here, uh, including our special guest. We have people from Hong Kong and China and different parts of Asia. This is a favorable time for you. Probably a little late for Europe uh, and the Middle East, but I think we may even have a few people coming from there, but uh, we've had great groups. We've sold out each and every one of these webinars. We've increased our capacity, and this is probably um, well over capacity today. I know over 800 people were wanting to get in. Um, so I'm gonna launch into our presentation today uh, just to take advantage of every minute. I saw this video and uh, had to share it. This is Venice, Italy not Venice, Los Angeles. Look at that. So certainly not possible just a little while ago. And I uh, saw this from, uh, uh, I think it's uh, the president of New Zealand, uh, Jacinda Ardern in the Atlantic. Getting through this crisis intact is just one step in a longer process towards a brave new world. And this has been a theme for us. Uh, of course, we're talking about high value musculoskeletal pain management and prehab and rehab and the challenges with telehealth. Um, uh, maybe the challenges aren't with telehealth. Maybe the challenges are in our clinics and in our gyms. <laughs> maybe telehealth is constraining us in ways that make it easier for us to guide by the side. But there are certainly lessons here that I know we're going to talk a lot about today with how when we go back to our clinics and it's so easy to give people what they're expecting in terms of passive care and biomedical explanations um, uh, in the short time that we have in contact with our clients and patients. Uh, if in fact the deeper dive to really get to know somebody in, in the online coaching space um, isn't something that can teach us uh, uh, more efficient ways to do this even later. Um, the virus has done more for waking up people to the need for a no BS rehab approach than any advertising ever could. Um, I, I really feel strongly about that. One of our themes has been this uh, message from Roderick Henderson um, about trying to pivot from trying to be like uh, corrective exercise, manual therapy, uh, uh, type of superhero where people go, oh my God, you have the best hands or that was the most amazing exercise. Uh, I just don't know I could do that on my own. To being like Alfred, we're empowering people and building their self-efficacy so that they feel more confident um, and they're motivated, they're more adherent and compliant with self-care, which of course is the goal. Um, Dr. Levitt said uh, over three decades ago um, that rehab is teaching people about self-management. Um, this is in line with Hippocrates, who said the first treatment is to teach people to avoid what harms them. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically the way he said it was, was uh, uh, first do no harm. And Dr. Levitt riffed on that and spun it into the first treatment is to teach people to avoid what harms them. And tragically, the Batman role is like a fool's gold. So the Batman role uh, is like a short-term thing. Um, 
and it feels better and then we all are happy but in the long run it doesn't change behaviors and that's really what we want to get to today so for me i'm starting to play with this formula evidence-based best practices equals rehab it always has reassurance and reactivation that's rehab uh, rehab is is active care more than passive care it's it's self-care it's not just supervised exercise that's a form of dependency too so telehealth constrains low value options like passive care and medical interventions so we're seeing how telehealth is really valuable obviously you can't do passive care uh, i mean you could you could get people to you know, use a foam roll or something, I guess. Um, and we're not saying passive care is bad or wrong, um, just that self-care is higher value. In other words, uh, the definition we're using for high value is more benefit and less harm. Um, COVID-19 has led to far greater implementation of musculoskeletal best practice guidelines uh, than 30 years of education uh, and research and dissemination of, of research and meta-analyses of research and guidelines. Uh, knowledge translation is notoriously slow, uh, but somehow uh, COVID has gotten upstream of all that. Um, so I begin to wonder now, far more than when we started this series only a few weeks ago, uh, can telehealth actually be part of the solution? And I shared this quote, I wanna share it again from Rachel Locke, one of our first principals of movement faculty in London. And she started a master's program with me in England uh, back in 1997. And uh, people in this master's program, they were all chiropractors from all over Europe and the Middle East. It was a cohort of about 40 of them. Rachel was one of them. And they were learning how to do an audit of their own practices. They were learning how to review literature and they were learning how to discern um, through the methodology section of the papers, not just the abstracts, um, uh, whether or not a study was robust or not. Uh, and then they were learning how to do a chart review and an introspection of their own practice to see if their practice was consistent with the guidelines. In other words, were they bridging the gap from science to practice? And if not, why not? And if not, what were the steps? And so, you know, they were learning to do this and I came in after the first edition of Rehab Spine was published and got to have fun with the group and, and teach them a lot of practical uh, stuff and tools. And Rachel just the other day said, telehealth is moving forward each day, more patients are signing up. I like, this was the kicker, I like how personal it is, getting patients to exercise in their living rooms, reassuring, coaching and having a chat. And I'm finding people in the comfort of their home are pretty damn receptive to being pushed really, really hard. Um, I wanna share this video, this is from uh, Peter O'Sullivan's group, uh, Body Logic, uh, also in Australia, and I thought it kind of explains what's happening, how they've pivoted. So, Pete, with, uh, with the whole coronavirus pandemic happening, um, lots of practices are moving towards telehealth rehabilitation, and there's been some interesting research, uh, for example, systematic review that showed that telehealth was as effective as face-to-face -face consultations for the management of musculoskeletal pain and, and injuries. You know, um, can you kind of talk to how people get better or how telehealth was proven to be just as effective as your in-person face-to-face consultations. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and it doesn't come as a great surprise to me, Kev, because I think what we're learning more and more about musculoskeletal pain is um, the things that are really important around pain are for people to have a clear understanding of what's going on for them. That's around educating them, but also to learn tools to get back in control of their pain and to, to regain function. Um, and so these are the traditional tools of like hands-on, pushing and um, massage or uh, manipulation um, or kneeling of the body. The things around um, developing a, an understanding and building confidence um, and having strategies of getting back to function again. And these are things that we can do just in this format in the way we doing it now. Uh, did I just cut out? I was told Professor Mosley can't be heard by anybody. Is that true? If you searched him on uh, the attendees.
Let me start this again here. I apologize. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. I was told that uh, Professor Mosley was not able to talk, but I had heard him. Is uh, Lorimer, are you there now? Can we hear you? I've been promoted to a You've panelist. Been promoted. Beautiful. All right, I'm going to start this video up again then. Did everybody see this? I, I saw some of it. I think I think I cut out at my end, actually. Right. Sorry about that. All right. I think everybody I'm back with you. Now, Dr. Chow, can everybody hear Professor Mosley now? Yes. All right. I'm going to start this video again. So Sorry about that. With, uh, with the whole coronavirus pandemic happening, um, lots of practices are moving towards telehealth rehabilitation. And yeah. there's been some interesting research, uh, for example, systematic review that showed that telehealth was as if... I'm not sharing my screen, folks. Is that true? Yes, press, press share. Yep, share screen now is good. There we go. La, third try is the charm. So, Pete, with, uh, with the whole coronavirus pandemic happening, um, lots of practices are moving towards telehealth rehabilitation. And yeah. there's been some interesting research, uh, for example, systematic review that showed that telehealth was as effective as face-to-face -face consultations for the management of musculoskeletal pain and, and injuries. Yeah. Um, can you kind of talk to how people get better or, or how telehealth was proven to be just as effective as your in-person face-to-face consultations? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and it doesn't come as a great surprise to me, Kev, because I think what we're learning more and more about musculoskeletal pain is um, the things that are really important around pain are for people to have a clear understanding of what's going on for them. That's around educating them, but also to learn tools to get back in control of their pain and to, to regain function. Um, and so these are the traditional tools of like hands-on, pushing and um, massage or uh, manipulation um, or needling of the body. The things around um, developing a, an understanding and building confidence um, and having strategies of getting back to function again. And these are things that we can do just in this format and the way we're doing it now. And the beauty of um, uh, video consulting particularly is that we can easily demonstrate to people. So I can get up and uh, demonstrate movement uh, and set a program up, but I can also look at how you're doing it. So it's got this capacity to both communicate and to watch and to modify behavior and set up a program uh, that is what we would do in a normal uh, consultation. Um, and the, the, the disconnect in terms of you being face to face or me putting on my hands on you are not the key things that influence whether a person gets better or not. That's much more around, do you understand what's going on? Have you got a clear plan? Have you got strategies that you can implement to, to make changes to get you back to living again? And there are things you can do easily through telehealth. Wow, that was great. So I just love listening to Peter O'Sullivan and his crew. They uh, left uh, face to face. Uh, they didn't feel it was necessary or uh, part of uh, social distancing uh, uh, in terms of their responsibilities. And um, now we're seeing all these unanticipated benefits that telehealth is consistent. So I wanna welcome a very special guest, uh, Lorimer, who I met in Los Angeles. I don't know what it was, Lorimer, 10 years ago, uh, but we've had a lot of conversations the last couple of years leading up to the publication of the third edition of my book, even to the extent where I changed the title of the book uh, uh, because uh, Lorimer said uh, I should, and he made a great argument. Uh, so Lorimer, I wanna welcome you to our audience. Uh, and uh, so much. I just am so grateful you're here. Um, any thoughts uh, after listening to Peter talk there? He just recaps things so clearly. Uh, what do you think about uh, when you hear, hear, hear his thoughts about the steps for uh, communication that, that uh, we can still uh, achieve even, even through telehealth? Yeah, I mean, what, uh, I'm humbled to be asked the question. I mean, Pete's, Pete's uh, uh, he's, he's a national treasure down here. Um, it makes, he often makes, usually makes perfect sense. And I, I can't come from a perspective of a lot of experience with uh, telehealth in the, in the time of COVID. Uh, but I can certainly 
uh, I certainly resonate with this idea that much of the power of our of our interactions can be captured uh, without being in the same room. I I think there is power in the personal interaction as well, uh, and it will be interesting to see. Uh, yeah, what what happens? Like, do we do we end up um, having a small proportion of people where it's not going to cut the mustard? Uh, we still need to be able to see them to see the stuff that's out of video shot, if you like. Or, um, but I, I certainly really resonated with um, Pete's statement there that the the things that we can't we can't do on telehealth are not the powerful mediators of change. Uh, they, they can be used as vehicles, perhaps. Uh, and I noted that you early on said, um, it's not that doing this passive stuff is bad, it's just that it's not as good. And, uh, or you didn't use those words, but I think I got you right. Not if I got yeah. the feel of it. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and I, 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 I think the evidence is pretty clear that when people understand uh, they're more likely to have a good outcome and there's there's nothing preventing us from from understanding from modeling from encouraging from reassuring all that sort of stuff uh, that Pete's talking about so uh, I love that you've you've sort of given me the honor of of being able to give a commentary on on that and and what you said so far but I'm no expert on that but you've just listened to those who are well we're gonna we're gonna dive head first into creating that personal connection uh, through our conversations, our critical conversations and how to take people's story and deal with some of the, the, the barriers that people commonly have. You, you've said that um, uh, the elephant in the room is that uh, we all talk about education like it's, like it's straightforward and simple um, and that we know how to do it and what the steps are and we have time to do it. And, and, and the reality is, is because of vested interests, et cetera, and training, um, really uh, reassurance and reactivation aren't, are, are, are sound simple, but, but often people are clamoring for, oh, don't I need a scan to find out what's wrong, or I have a scan and it's told me I have, you know, degenerative this or torn that, um, and uh, can't you just put your elbow in my side or crack my back? There's all these expectations that people have that wind up, uh, uh, dragging us into areas to serve them uh, out of empathy that maybe aren't necessarily uh, the compassionate path of, of leading them in the direction of empowerment. Uh, instead, we're being empathetic, but we're building more dependency by, by catering to some of those expectations. Does that, does that, does that ring true at all? Yeah, I like, so is that a question to me still? Am I... Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, one, one phrase you use there, Craig, that I love is, uh, is acknowledging that um, it's not doing that stuff is not necessarily the compassionate path. I think you use that phrase. And I reckon that's a, that's a real barrier for a lot of us to, to resist the urge in ourselves to provide immediate uh, care, passive care, uh, as though that is the compassionate thing to do. And uh, in the broader uh, context of what we're dealing with, I think your comment is fantastic. It's, it's not necessarily, we're, we're not empowering, we're not enabling and all that, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but as you were talking, I thought of, I thought of something that uh, is really relevant um, to I think our connection, one of our connections on this. And, and that's that idea of what people expect to mm -hmm. happen when they turn up and you mentioned you now the elbow in the in the butt or whatever uh and that that in as you said early early today that 20 years of guidelines we haven't had a shift in care like the care the, like the shift that we're seeing now that we can't be in the same room as people glorious uh and people can't have the same expectations of us as clinicians uh, they they can't expect us to do something to them so in a way, I think that, well, I see that as quite a significant barrier to implementing best practice. Uh, and that is that the consumer expectations and the community norms are still dominated 
by the rest of the evidence base outside of the top of it. You know, the top of it is the, the guidelines, meta-analyses, the systematic reviews, the studies, the RCTs, all that sort of stuff. And then you've got this big base of the pyramid, which is, you know, public opinion and expectations. And those expectations, you know, what, a lot of the stuff I'm really excited about at the moment is how do we change consumer expectations and community norms? Because until COVID, that felt like that was the only option left for us to change clinical practice. Uh, but we may be fast tracking a whole lot of stuff through this. Anyway, I, I sort of got a bit excited about what you you said. I love that. So you can see the article here, Whole of Community Pain Education for Back Pain. And this paper came out after Lancet. And I think uh, during the time you and I were talking about having you contribute to my book and um, you know, I think I can share if, if it's okay. It, was, it took a little bit of arm bending and persistence and you finally <laughs> succumbed. You gave, you gave in uh, to uh, the fact that I, I wouldn't give up. And, and I'm really grateful. I want to thank you because we did change the title of the book from a practitioner's manual to a person-centered approach or a patient-centered approach. And this was sort of a, a uh, on Lorimer's ins insistence, I would say, and, and, and rightfully so. And I'm so grateful because since, um, since my book was delayed and we were able to, to wait for chapters like yours, um, this idea of the person-centered approach or patient-centered approach is, is, is what I want to talk about today. And it, it's so much about us listening to people and them feeling heard and then us gaining trust so we can guide them. Um, and I don't know that this whole idea of education doesn't have a lot packed into it about listening skills. I don't know how you feel about, about these ideas. It's not about what we say as much as that they know that we heard them. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, but one thing that, that I'm learning repeatedly is how little I know about education. Uh, I think that we, we have, and you know, I've uh, a couple of times now in, in conferences and things, I've, you know, I put myself on the record of apologizing, uh, really for my contribution to a misunderstanding, uh, which was an understanding that I had of what education is you know, as though education is, uh, a delivery of content. Now, the, the people who know education will hear that and say, oh, well, of course it is. You know, it's the, uh, education is, is a complex field. Uh, and I went into it pretty naively, I think. And, and I think that I have influenced uh, others uh, to, to take on my naivety. And what, what I'm, you know, the last few years, I've, I've just, yeah, been... Uh, learning a lot about that distinction between education and and the um, the the translation of understanding and operational knowledge uh, that someone has inside them, so they make different decisions. Because because I think that's what we we want to get to, and uh, definitely trust uh, hearing uh, the story feels like it's important. The thing that I think. Uh, I'm most excited about in what I'm learning is, and, and I feel like an idiot for not picking this up for, for 20 years, is that, that really uh, we don't, education's not Im important if it is the delivery of stuff. What's important is learning. Uh, and, and someone has to learn a whole lot of stuff at a whole lot of levels in order to, uh, harness the knowledge and the skills and the strategies and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I think we're going to, I think we are in the middle of a revolution of education. And uh, I think the argument in this paper that you've got on screen remains, I, I feel like it remains a good one uh, because I, I see, you know, that the Lancet series, I, that's great work. These are, these are absolute experts in the field. But I couldn't help but just be a little bit annoyed again that we came out bashing the GPs and bashing the consumers. Mm. Uh, and 
And we still mention in there, education's first line, but as you say, as though we all know how to do it. And, you know, I've written, I've written a lot of papers on education and I've done a lot of studies on it. And uh, I've spoken as though I have expertise on it. And I'm learning so much about what, I, what, what we've got wrong and, and where we have to go. And that interpersonal thing is perhaps critical because ultimately someone has to learn. We can't, we can't do that. We cannot learn for them. Mm-mm. So what can we do and draw on this massive body of, of literature and, and knowledge and expertise People have been trying to do this for decades, centuries, perhaps. And in health, I reckon education is our key. I think it's our key um, treatment. Yeah. Uh, but we're a long way behind, long way behind on how to do it in a way that we get learning. We can do it in a way that we feel good about ourselves and we feel like, oh, yeah, I delivered this and I gave them the pain talk. <laughs> Jeez, I'm really sorry, world, that I was involved in promoting that myth. Oh boy, you know, there's a. It reminds me when um, I was learning uh, about the ancient Greek schools of medicine, the Aeschylean and Hygieian. The Hygieian is the older, and that's the education. So it came before all the fix-it treatment, scalpel, pills, potions. And a patient of mine just recently gave me a, a, a name of a book, which I got and I started to read. I shared it with Aaron and Geronimo called The Ignorant Schoolmaster. And you're reminding me of this. It's by Jacques Ranciere. And in it, he talks about the stultification that occurs in pedagogy when we're trying to explicate things to people. Nothing ever happens unless people learn for themselves. And so it was a, a French situation where the French thought that they were so smart and they were going to teach uh, around the world and they were teaching um, in Flemish this work and they thought that everything had to be taught by a master and then this one person started to realize that the way people learn is the way children learn. They learn by trial and error. They learn by being put in an environment where they have to discover for themselves. And this is similar to something Tom Zhao in China told me about, that that we don't learn by being told what to do. Uh, We learn um, really through like gamification by somebody setting up the the constraints and then we explore and eventually you find what works. And maybe we've been telling people too much and maybe that's the stultification. Uh, we give them all the steps. They're all correct. But like Feldenkrais said, it's incorrect to correct. I don't know. Um, so you're, I think we're of like mind that we both realize that we haven't been doing it right. We have to keep an open mind. Um, so that's really what, what the virus is doing is it's giving us reflection. So I wanted to talk about three challenges with you. One, as far as education, the challenge of people want an image to find out what's wrong, or they see somebody who says, uh, you know, I'm gonna find out the exact cause uh, and, and uses that to, to, to drive the treatment programming. Um, number two, what you started with, uh, people want uh, the gratification. They want the, the short-term pain relief. Um, um, they don't know it's short-term, they just wanna be out of pain. Um, and that leads to passive care expectations, and we want to satisfy that, right? And then thirdly, the uh, fact that people uh, feel dismissed if uh, we don't find anything. So if the MD doesn't find anything, you know, like you don't need surgery, you know, and then they say the pain is in your head, that obviously is terrible. Um, and secondly, it leads the chiro and the PT or the trainer, massage therapist, et cetera, uh, to, to jump right into the vacuum and go, oh yeah, we found this, 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 and this. We found a sacral torsion. We found a leg length inequality, uh, tight psoas, uh, ad infinitum. And, and how productive really is that? And, and so I wanna talk about these three conundrums, if you will. Uh, so we'll hit the first one and I'll use your slide um, <laughs> and combine it with some Lancet. Um, so there's a mismatch between best practice recommendations and the beliefs of the public, first of all. Best practice being what high value care is as we're describing it and, and the public you know, thinking they need imaging and best practice, no you don't. 
public thinking uh, that uh, pills and, and passive things are going to help, whereas actually simpler things like reassurance and reactivation are. And, and your quote here, persist, your slide, persisting pain is a massive problem. We know how best to prevent and treat it, but we aren't doing it. Best treatment and prevention makes no sense to most people. So I love that. Um, um, and I think that we can, uh, we can, we can build on that. Do you want to uh, amplify on this, this thought that the best treatment and prevention makes no sense in this mismatch between what, what best practices and what the public thinks? Yeah, I, I always enjoy magnifying this point because I, I think it's a, I think it's a real crunch issue that the, you know, and the guidelines have said, based on evidence, uh, very, very clear that education, active and psychological therapies and self-management skills are the best treatments we have. And I, I quite enjoy using that phrase, actually. So when in my interactions with, with consumers and with other professionals, I like using that phrase. Instead of guideline care and all that, I say the best treatments we have. And that feels like it, it cuts through a little bit more. We've known what the best treatments we have are for some time, but as long as, as we understand, uh, or as long as pain is understood to be a marker of tissue damage, then the best treatments we have make absolutely no sense. Like why, why uh, learn about stuff if you've got a damaged body part? Why do active stuff if it's hurting? Because that means damage in the old model. Why do psych? I mean, why why go to a psychologist? What an outrageous proposition! That that if you believe uh, pain is a marker of tissue damage, and and someone says, well, have you thought about psychology? That's an outrageous proposition, and that is, in my view, uh, very worthy of anger mm. and uh, and feeling dismissed and all this sort of stuff that we're talking about. And self-management skills, well, I, I don't want self-management. What I want is treatment. What I want is to be fixed. So all of those things, I, I, I really do believe they make no sense. And our, my, my own sort of personal experience of that is probably where that conviction was born. Uh, you know, going, uh, you know, having a, a, a really problematic back pain problem going into, as an undergraduate university student, going into the biology lessons and the neuroscience lessons and getting turned on by possibility and complexity, uh, and then going into my therapy lessons and wondering if, if I'm in the wrong course, you know, just seeing this disconnect, because uh, the, the, the principle remains the same. The, the, the best treatments we have make total sense according to the contemporary science, according to evidence, according to basic and, uh, and systems neuroscience, according to behavioral science, they make beautiful sense. Uh, but most people don't have the luxury of that understanding. And that's where I see we have a massive job to do. And, and we, and that's, that's the idea behind the whole of community education that, uh, what what are the what are the clinches that we that if we got across to people on mass would make the best treatments we have make sense? Does that is that a is that an appropriate magnification? Mm, it's perfect, absolutely perfect. So I want I want to dovetail that with this, and I'll let people read this. So there's the juxtaposition between the great evidence based orthopedic surgeon from from Sweden, uh, who's passed away a few years ago, the great Alf Nakamson, who of course took all of his peers to task for unnecessary surgeries and imaging, and said, I've been studying low back pain for the last 50 years of my life, and if anyone says they know where the pain comes from, they're full of it. And Professor Stuart McGill, all back pain has a cause, and a thorough assessment will reveal a cause with only rare exceptions. So, <laughs> It's not an either or proposition, um, but I want to ask you, uh, Lorimer, um, your thoughts on this, this juxtaposition, because this is out there. We have the evidence-based best practices, people, the people behind the Lancet uh, 
uh, document uh, and all the guidelines, um, non-specific back pain, 90% of the time, um, no known cause, um, and how dissatisfying that is to the public. And so is the solution, you know, obviously we can identify things that might be red flags, we can identify nerve root, but if it's not one of those things, these facet, SI, myofascial subcategories, et cetera, are pretty much on thin ice. Um, uh, but people like wanting passive care, they wanna be told, why do I have pain? And that's a sincere uh, desire they have. Should we, like with passive care, kowtow, and give them what they want? Should we give people, oh, well, I found the cause of your pain, it's blah, 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 blah. Or how do we, how do we finesse this? This to me is a, a really big issue that, that is also an elephant in the room. People don't talk about it, but it's a big issue. Um, mm. what, what, what are your thoughts? Oh, this is truly a cab south conversation uh, that, that feels too early here in this part of the world, you know, 8 30 in the morning to pop open a nice bottle of South Australian. I haven't Cabernet done enough foreplay, Laura Murray, come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, but I love, I love the intent of, of trying to grapple with this complexity. And uh, I see the, com the levels of this complexity uh, almost as though, uh, you know, you look at one of those, those drawings of the structure of the earth. And as a kid, the structure of the earth is just the grass. And then you, and slowly you understand more about it and you go, oh, look, there's that under there. Oh, there's rock. Oh, there's fluid. Well, oh, there's water in there. And then these levels of complexity and layers just keep keep going down seemingly forever. And, and I think this juxtaposition captures that complexity because uh, we, we, the decision makers in a, in a clinical interaction, you know, we, we're making decisions for ourselves as, as clinicians or as researchers, our and Stuart, uh, as authorities, uh, as uh, supposed uh, communicators of the truth. All, the, all these things are what we have. And I don't understand how I work. Uh, I spend a lot of time trying to work it out and reflect on what my own uh, processes are and my own position from which I I'm approaching this interaction and that's just one tiny little bit of the pie of lots of contributors you know we've got the same the person in front of us is bringing all this the the research world is doing all this the research world has a personality you know that that is under pressure from uh, granting bodies and from political forces and from commercial interests and you know, you could keep listing contributors to the problem of pain. In fact, this this was this, this sort of broad understanding of the problem of pain, I think, is 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 really relevant to this apparent juxtaposition. And and I think these two perspectives do capture uh, very uh, very persistent ideas out there. Uh, I I suspect that um, Stuart McGill's perspective would be more widely held than ALF's. I, I suspect, I don't, I don't know that, that's just an impression I, I get. Um, I, I feel like... More popular. I think the evidence-based people behind Lancet are more in line with the, the Nockhamson view. Yeah, and, and if, I, if, if I was to uh, try it and I, I would never you know, expect to, to be on level footing with those guys. But, you know, if, if I was to quote something, I'd say, you know, I've been studying pain for 25 years, 30 years, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and if anyone asks me where pain comes from, I would say it comes from you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the mo and the most proximal organ is the brain. Uh, <laughs> and if, if there'll be the regulars out there waiting for me to say something like that and we'll type in you neurocentric ignoramus. Uh, obviously a brain can't sit on the pillow and produce pain, but, uh, you know, I used to, uh, I used to love those games when you're a kid of the last one who touched it. Uh, and the last organ that touched it is the brain. So I, I think the brain has a really fundamental role in producing pain. And I think you, pain comes from the human. It's, it's in my view, this is my understanding of the problem and it's produced by the brain in order to make you behave in a way that will 
improve your your livelihood i think uh we use the phrase of you know protect your body tissues and those sorts of things uh i i look at the the quote from uh from alf and i think uh if someone says they know where pain is i don't think they're full of whatever that word is it's only got three of the four letters uh i think think that people can be very sincere and based on on good motives and all that sort of stuff uh i don't agree with the quote from from stuart mcgill uh because for two reasons i think the evidence uh is it's overwhelming against that perspective. Uh, and I'm completely convinced that we put ourselves under illusions that, uh, that our reasoning and our allocation of cause is, is accurate. And those illusions require us to model the human as a very simple, uh, I mean, even in biomechanical studies, we model body parts as simple segments that are actually highly complex segments that are dynamic. Uh, so even at, even before taking us beyond biomechanics, we're, we've already simplified it. So I actually don't agree with either of those quotes, but, but you know, it's probably, you know, well, all of us would have a different quote uh, on this sort of stuff. Uh, the shift from... I think, and I, I just want to yeah. finish something on that. Sorry to Craig. I, I think that the, uh, I think Stu, Stu's quote is a, is a higher risk quote for the world. And, and the reason I think that, and he won't be surprised to hear, hear me say that, is that uh, if, uh, if we keep promoting this idea that pain really is as we thought it was 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, uh, and someone comes into the clinic and we do this thing and they get resolution, and that confirms the, that, that all back pain has a cause and a, and a thorough assessment, you just need to see the right person with the right skill set, yeah, reveal right. the exact cause, and you get a you get pain relief. Then you not only have to reject the the volumes of research saying that pain relief could have been mediated by a lot of mechanisms, but you also strengthen in what is, in my view, the illusion that the next episode will be that problem back. And and you talked earlier about doing no harm. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be very careful that we don't do harm for the future with, with propagating and implanting and, and strengthening pathological models of a problem uh, for which the, there is overwhelming evidence against their validity. Wow, that's, that's uh, very, there's a lot to, to reflect on when you say that. And I'm thinking of um, something Daniela Vaz uh, wrote. I quoted her last week with Matt Lowe and Peter Stilwell. She's a physio and a PhD in Brazil who's been working with uh, uh, World Health Organization's International Classification of Functioning and pivoting us from a pathology-centered model to a person-centered model. And, and, and I don't have it on the slide yet, but she said, we want to empower patients and recognize them at the center of the decision-making process. And to me, the person-centered, patient-centered approach is, is naturally, um, naturally complex. People are complex. There's a lot of influences. It's multifactorial to oversimplify things and to say that it's from this or from that is, is uh, like you said, it, it's, it, it doesn't jive with the literature at all. And it gives people the wrong idea that we fixed them, that we found it. It's that holy grail idea. And I think that holy grail idea has been around in chiropractic and osteopathy and orthopedic surgery for too long. Uh, we wanna help people with valued life activities. So we wanna start by finding out what are their valued life activities and what do they think about their pain? Let's, let's, let's continue here. A definitive diagnosis was perceived by many to justify, reassure, and legitimize their symptoms. I think this is why people search for that and why chiropractors and orthopedists want to give it. Um, however, this is contradictory, to your point, to current evidence-based low back pain management that strongly advises against routine back imaging in the absence of red flags, as an example. Um, with imaging considered to be of low value uh, healthcare and a potential driver for unhelpful beliefs. And we could substitute some of our functional assessments in there, 
for sacral torsion and trigger points and, and the like. This finding highlights the clear mismatch between people's perceived health information needs and clinicians' knowledge or maybe comfort or lack thereof in low back pain management. It's a lot easier to think it's, it's so simple that we just have to learn about uh, muscle imbalances and trigger points and how to read MRIs and test for weak muscles. Of course, we're going to find things. The question is, are, are, are we finding things that are uh, coincidental and asymptomatic even in the functional realm, just as they are in the, the, the pathoanatomic and anatomy realm? So I've seen this one. I don't know that it's yours, but it's people who who uh, are uh, Instagramming your thoughts. Uh, what you see on an image is not always what is causing your pain. Lots of people may have those same findings, but no pain, the false positive rate. So part of reassurance to me, the first step in evidence-based practice is reassuring people about the false positive rate of pathology uh, on asymptomatic people. And I think Mary O'Keefe, um, said it quite aptly, we aren't in the camp of saying structure is not important. It is important, but that doesn't mean that there's a, a correlation one-to-one -one or that there's damage or that this is even the driver of their pain. Or I like to say it's important, but there's nine other things that are important. And we want to find out where we can get uh, uh, the greatest return on investment, the greatest ROI. Where can we make the most impact from our intervention? where can we intervene with the greatest benefit and the least risk? That's high value care, right? So, so that's what we're looking for. And, and this mismatch in ideas between what people expect and think and, and what the evidence says is pretty stark. Again, from the Lancet group, uh, uh, people's beliefs about back imaging, um, uh, over 50% of people think an x-ray or a scan is necessary to get the best care for back pain. 31% strongly agree. Um, Almost 50% think everybody uh, with back pain should get an image. So it's easy for me, if I want to make somebody happy when they come in, to do what I know is not the evidence, to give them what they want. They come in, oh, we got to get a scan to figure out what's wrong. There's so much downside risk to that, um, uh, as you've already said, uh, uh, Lorimer. Going all the way back to 2000, one of the think tanks, the Fourth International Forum on Low Back Pain Research and Primary Care, uh, Borkin and Van Tulder et al. talked about patients are dissatisfied with this nonspecific label. So this is our conundrum, right? Uh, achieving a validated subclassification system was the top research priority, and I think we're still chasing that holy grail. Um, finding a subclassification, finding, you know, I don't know. I mean, I use yellow flags. I, some people, it's more affective. Some, it's more cognitive. So some are very anxious and some have stinking thinking. Um, uh, some are unfit, um, some have a lot of patho and morals nodes and marrow spinal canals. Um, people are complicated. I think accepting and embracing uncertainty may be the way forward. Um, you said something in a chat we had a while ago that is similar to what you've been saying today about like you thought you knew things before and you apologize for some of the language you've used about pain science. Um, and, and you said something to me about how um, you think that one of the, 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 one of the situations that's the hardest for us to make headway with is when the patient has a fixed mindset. And uh, I always thought that like the anxious person is the one who's the hardest to help, the one who's catastrophizing and has tons of fear avoidance. But I'm starting to think, if I understood you correctly, that, 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 that you were onto something because now in hindsight, I see that the people who I'm least able to help are often the very intelligent, very res resource oriented people who are more likely to go up the food chain and they will get the scan and then they will hear that, that the cause of the pain was found. And then they'll be told, you know, the typical sort of things, which is, uh, if you can't live with it anymore, we'll fix it. Um, and in the meantime, restrict your activities and avoid the things that hurt. So equating hurt with harm, which isn't the evidence, um, saying that we found the problem when in fact, that's not consistent with the evidence and that the surgery is the answer when um, 
you've exhausted the other options and you're, 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 you're ready for the ultimate solution. Of course, the, the, the most robust evidence says in most of these cases, uh, the surgery wasn't necessary anyway. So um, again, we're kind of back to this need that people have for a label and the fact that there's this group out there uh, that aren't showing up on the fear avoidance scales who have a fixed, ha have a, a fixed mindset. And, and I don't know if you remember that conversation where you told me that these are people that even you struggle with. <laughs> that even I struggle with. Uh, gee, I struggle with, uh, with a lot of people. Um, I, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a few thoughts on what you said. One thing that I, I really want to respond to is uh, this, this idea that people are complex. Uh, because I think it's really important. Uh, and I just want to make sure that we uh, that that none of us start to think it's only the people seeking care who are complex. Mm. Uh, and in in all of the work that we do, there is always one very complex organism, uh, and that's us. And I I really think it's worth us spending time trying to understand ourselves uh, why. Why do we, you know, in, in any particular situation, you know, why do we give in to the request for an X-ray at that time? Or, or why do we hold our ground? Or what is it about this interaction with this person who seems to be, uh, to not at all be able to tolerate the uncertainty of their situation? Uh, why do we respond like we do with it? And, and how do I tolerate uncertainty? And you know, all these sort of the questions that we ask about our, our patients, I think we often tend to think that that we're actually not <laughs> not afflicted with all the same problems, and we, and we are, I think. Uh, but but we have this this job where uh, where we need to do our very best uh, with the resources and the skill set that we have, and but that we're not just a resource and skill set. We're we're a human with our own foibles and and biases and and complexities and it's you know that's why i i feel like it's it's uh it's so problematic to do a particular say in, in my background as a physiotherapist to do a, do a particular therapeutic technique see an effect and then conclude like and then pin the mechanism on one small part of that entire interpersonal interaction uh I just think that we are so complex, one individual is so complex, and then it's exponentially larger because you've got two. Is it exponentially right? You know, it's squared. Uh, you know, very complex times very complex, not very complex plus very complex. Uh, anyway, so that's something I want to respond to. And I also wanted to, uh, I'm just going to stick this quote in the chat room. Uh, this is a quote from George Engel. Uh, in the 1960s. So George Engel, uh, uh, most of you will know, proposed the biopsychosocial model, uh, was not in, did not have the same understanding of pain that we have, no, have now. Uh, but I'll just stick his, his quote in there and then I'll read it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to modify the language to bring it up to speed as far as, you know, inclusive language uh, and pain. To be, think, to be able to think of pain as an entity uh, sitting out there in the body, in a tissue, uh, separate from the human and caused by an identifiable substance or injury, apparently has great appeal to the human mind. Perhaps the persistence of such views in medicine and healthcare reflect the operation of psychological processes to protect the health professional from the emotional implications of the material with which they deal. This is one of my favorite George Engel quotes because it, it puts the, uh, it puts the mirror up for us to say, so what, why do I like, why am I so attracted to the idea of a, a pain receptor sitting in a, in a painful bit of tissue and sending a message that my, all my brain, all this amazing complex thing has to do is register it. Like, why is that so attractive to me? And that's a question that I think we don't ask enough. I think we often ask, why is that, why, why is that idea so attractive to this person in front of us? Or why is another idea so unattractive and, 
Uh, and I think, I, I really think it's worth us spending time reflecting on why, you know, why does that appeal to me? And, and in the same way, I spend time thinking, so why does it appeal to me that we're complex? And why, do, why am I naturally drawn more towards Alf's, Alf Nackham's and his quote than I am towards Jupiter? What is it about me that draws me there? I think they're really important questions and really tough questions. Uh, but I think we become better clinicians. I think we become better humans when we engage with those questions. Uh, anyway, I'm off topic. And, and no, what, uh, I, I, what, what did you actually ask me again, I'm Craig? Come back to <laughs> Sorry. About fixed mindset, which doesn't even show up in the, the, the yellow flag scales. Uh, but I'm going to come back to it later. So we're, we're going to revisit. Cool. cool. What, what I can say on, on response to that, and uh, not only because there's a chance that uh, she's on air, but one of the PhD students in our group, Caitlin Howlett, is looking uh, directly at this idea of, of flexibility, uh, not musculoskeletal flexibility, sort of psychological mental flexibility, and is digging into that research and is in the middle of a... Uh, a systematic review that is so big and demanding because the field is like a dog's breakfast. Uh, but the reason we're going down that track uh, is this, yeah, this impression that to be able to recover in any situation, you, you need to be psychologically flexible somewhere in the system. The system has to be flexible to, uh, to adopt a new new approach and to learn from new data, uh, so this fixed mindset I think is is one clear manifestation of that, and I think that's going to reveal some juicy stuff over the next decade. Mm, thank you. Um, I've just unmuted uh, our guest, uh, another guest with us, Peter Stillwell. I didn't realize you were going to be in the house. I want to thank so many people for joining us. Joseph Chen from China. We have people from South America, from Europe, from Thailand, um, uh, Wales, uh, England. Um, really uh, thrilled that we have so many people that are with us and staying with us through this long form. It's not just a 20 minute TED talk we're doing here. Uh, but Peter, do you have any thoughts about uh, this I these ideas we're referring to about the person-centered approach and, and the biopsychosocial kind of constructs? Can you hear me there? Yeah, we can hear you. Nice, nice. Uh, as always, I uh, enjoy tuning into these. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity. I'm, I'm sitting here. It's late night here in, in Canada uh, on the East Coast. So just cracked a, cracked a brew here. Um, but uh, I, I think you already hit on it all. Like you, you covered it. Love it. Love the conversation. And I unmuted my mic just to say uh, my greatest appreciation for you, Craig, for doing this. And Thank love you. listening. Love listening to Lorimer always. Uh, always learn so much every time. So it's just a, a gold mine. So that, that's all I have to add. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Oh, you, and uh, your, your mic is going to be unmuted. So uh, we may hit, we hit you up again. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think I have anything intelligent to, uh, to say, but uh, um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to listen in and thank you guys so much. Thank you. Anybody who tuned into the last webinar knows that, that, that's, that there's a lot, a lot to, uh, to riff on there. But um, I saw this uh, paper recently. It's a recap of Stephen Litton's work, uh, who just retired uh, from... Um, a uh, number of people, even Vlayan is on this group, uh, Pain Psychology in the 21st Centuries, about lessons. Um, and diagnosis of primary pain should also shift the focus from finding or excluding a physical cause to identifying many possible contributors, physical, psychological, and social, thereby expanding the range of treatment options for people with chronic pain. So I think it's just summarizing uh, exactly what we're talking about. And, and this goes back to a paper by Peter O'Sullivan and Jeremy Lewis uh, is a time to reframe how we care for people with non-traumatic musculoskeletal pain. The majority of persistent non-traumatic musculoskeletal pain disorders do not have a pathoanatomical diagnosis that adequately explains the individual's pain experience and their disability. So effective interventions to correct patients' unhelpful beliefs 
may require enabling clinicians, to your point, Lorimer, it's about the clinician, not just the patient, to communicate, again, education, how we communicate the, the role of imaging more effectively and provide reassurance and a meaningful management plan to patients. Um, however, limited time and financial pressures in clinical practice make this challenging. So the easy road is just to say, oh, we found the cause of pain, or let's go get the scan, and then we'll reconvene. I think there's a lot of um, things that hold people back. One of the things that was coming out from uh, people who are in the audience today from both Wales and South Africa was, especially in, in, in Wales, they were saying um, that, uh, you know, people have this 15 minute contact time with patients. Patients are expecting some, some relief of their symptoms or expecting passive care. We don't have time for all this uh, re reconfiguring of, of the landscape, the architecture of how we relate to people. Um, Lorimer, what, 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 do you, what does that trigger in you? I mean, I'm like not tolerant of that, but, but I know that that's not gonna help people change. Um, Did I lose Lorimer, uh, Aaron? He's, just um, he's still on there, he's muted. Uh, I'm good at the moment. Go. I am going in and out a bit. Okay, good. So yeah, it's Australia. We don't have, we don't have very good internet connections <laughs> yet. Kangaroos. Uh, so what, what, uh, what do you say to the practitioner who's talking about the, their constraints in terms of time and things like that? I'm really, really disappointed that that came to me because I say, oh, that's, that's just really hard. <laughs> um, and I guess I would say more. So how, how do you deal with that? What do you, what do, you do? Yeah, I'm, I'm no expert. How, I'll try the question to them. Yeah, well, uh, we, fortunately, a lot of these people are, are listening to us. So um, hopefully we're going to be able to give them, you know, trips and trips, tricks and tips to make it easier. You know, for me, um, I think we've been learning through all the guidelines about the importance of reassurance and reactivation. And I think um, we do have to spend more time, I think. I think the first visit, we have to spend significantly more time to build trust um, on follow-ups, maybe not as much, but um, I do think the landscape has to change. And I think that's to Rachel Locke's point that the telehealth is making it easier. And if we can make that a habit, maybe telehealth is the game changer. And now we build on that. So um, I would say to everybody in, in practice that uh, is used to having people want passive care or want to fix it approach or want a Batman approach that, that, that now is the time to get all people into telehealth because they're going to see how incredibly empowering this is when you guide by the side. Um, uh, this is another uh, uh, riff on some of your stuff, Lorimer, about uh, you know pain is both up and down regulation. It's it's certainly not Cartesian stimulus response, um, and the pain is not an accurate measure of tissue health. Um, I think people at this point in time realize the importance of the endogenous opioids and stress and sleep, uh, and ideas and expectations and cortisol levels. So I, I think. Uh, uh, it's a good anchoring slide. I don't know that we have to say a lot, but uh, if we go to the next big point, which is about these passive care expectations, which, which gets to uh, uh, satisfying people's desire, uh, Croft recently and, and Nadine Foster et al. said it's increasingly clear that simply expecting individual clinicians to adhere more closely to guidelines is not going to work. Um, just getting the information out there. And so really, uh, COVID has, has done a lot of the work for us. It's top down, it's large scale. It's done more than anything else ever could. Effective high value care for patients with back pain, uh, meaning things that benefit more, uh, uh, have more benefit than harm, will only be achieved through such large scale top down changes. Can we leverage COVID-19 uh, for um, uh, reinforcing these new patterns of behavior? Um, I showed these slides last uh, last webinar. The results paint a bleak picture. Only a minority of people apparently receive simple positive messages to stay active and exercise. 
while inappropriate use of imaging and passive care persists, this is, a, this is the problem. The care doctors give patients with low back pain is dominated by guideline discordant interventions that are unnecessary, expensive, and low value. And to your point, Lorimer, you're seeing that um, the dismissive uh, medical kind of model, very palliative and saying like, you have wear and tear, learn to live with it, uh, which isn't satisfactory. Um, is not only no is 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 no better than what a lot of chiros and PTs are doing, and in fact, what PTs and chiros are doing um, may, in some ways, even be worse. You know, you're looking at the McGill versus the Nockhamson quote, and 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 you're saying that you know I I I'm about the the person you, and and us our relationship, and really therefore I'm about like how I'm transmitting this information. Um, I think where the rubber hits the road is, is us getting a grip on, on how we share this information about empowerment. And, and I'd like to throw this to, to our panelists, Dr. Chow, my colleague in arms from New York City. You know, Ryan, you, you see so many of my bi-coastal patients in New York and Union Square and Lower Manhattan. You see so many people who are, who could, go to hospital, hospital for special surgeries and see the top doctors that work with the New York Yankees and New York Mets. Um, you deal with a lot of these issues every day. How do you, how do you motivate the, the, the basket case who wants a fix it approach? And, and you don't have treatment tables in your, in your facility. You don't even call patients patients. You, 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 you call them clients. Um, how, how do you make that work for, for you? I think a lot of it is is um, about making. I try to uh, make things actionable for people because uh, the current low value stuff is is really actionable. People come and expect to be fixed or to get um, a pain relief and things like that. But I know that education and and reactivation and reassurance are are um, what's best evidence for them. So I try to take those things and make them actionable. So setting the environment, having it be a gym is the, the equivalent of telehealth. It places constraints on people that change their expectations. So um, I, edu I try to educate people on um, why the, the, thir the, the things they've done in the past haven't worked and what we can do going forward. I think listening to you guys talk about uh, the education is being the most important thing, but we don't know how to do it or we can't make it. It doesn't necessarily validate people's um, uh, pain and, and what to do about it. I think about trying to make it actionable. People want more than just, hey, uh, this is protection and pain is protection for you. So here's here's some things you can do. Here's let me show you how to do it. And that's, I think, um, the, the, the smarter people who've who've uh, uh, been through it all are open to it. That's why they're coming to see me. So I think it's tricky, but you know, I think that's, that's what I've arrived at so far. Can you speak Ryan for a second? Um, I think Lorimer will appreciate this, the type of referrals you're getting now. So when you, you know, have people that start off, you know, living a fit life and they're in the gym culture, which is where you are, um, but how they upsell this to their friends who may be, aren't as fit and have been at hospital for special surgeries or getting passive care from a chiro or PT. Um, when you start to get those second and third referrals, um, tell, tell, us, tell us how you're, uh, what the language is that your patients are using when they try to explain what you do uh, to their friends. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people come for me initially for pain, but then it's, it ends up being kind of like the gift of injury where they come for pain and, and they're expecting just pain relief, but then they, they discover all these ways that training uh, intersects with uh, pain relief with also reducing chronic disease risks like cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and all these um, uh, other problems that they might have to deal with. So, so the language is, is you know, it's, it's hard for them to explain really quickly in a, in a quick referral, but they say, hey, you have to see this guy because He's going to help you with your pain, but he's also going to help you with a lot of other things um, that, are, that are relevant to these people because a lot of them tend to be older, successful, and are trying to, you know, revisit the fountain of youth. A lot of times the, the mm -hmm. pain is, is to them 
uh, indications of, of things that are coming. So it's very relieving for them to hear like, hey, this guy can help you with not just pain, but also uh, all these other things. I find too in my environment that uh, pivoting to the um, other things like diabetes and fall prevention or um, uh, pain from arthritis or just helping people. I mean, 50 is the new 50. So uh, we don't want to uh, use cliches like 50 is the new 30. That's disingenuous. But, but today our biological age and our chronological age are so off. People are living longer, but we're getting older sooner. We're, we're, our lifestyles, because we don't move enough and we eat so much processed foods, are driving us to feel older sooner. And let's just get back to, to where it was before. We talked in past webinars about x-ray evidence and uh, bones, x-rays from the 40s, bones from the industrial period and fossils from prehistoric times show that people had less arthritis we're the least healthy and we're the least active. So it can't be wear and tear. So we can debunk some of these ideas and I think give people, you know, what my mission is at LA Sports and Spine, which is tangible hope and an achievable plan. Um, your ability to make that actionable, Ryan, is, is unbelievable. Your ability to communicate that and how it flows out from, uh, from your reload uh, team is, is pretty remarkable. When I see like the Lancet, um, and I see this, again, same arguments, Lorimer, from 30 years ago, nothing new. And yet the needle doesn't get changed until COVID-19. Um, uh, to me, it's to your point about how, again, the elephant in the room is that education isn't so simple. Um, any thoughts, uh, Lorimer? Uh, yeah. Um, really just to to iterate that idea that, uh, and, and pick up something on that, pick on something that you said, Ryan, about, you know, you, you, you see education as a big part of, of what you do. Um, it's probably good to, to remind all of us that, uh, that uh, we, we educate in many, many ways. Uh, and it, it does strike me as remarkable that one, one of the, one of the side effects of what I think is a is a is a much larger appreciation for education within the musculoskeletal pain space than there was maybe 20 years ago. I think, and there are now you know there's there's commercial drivers for pain science education or therapeutic neuroscience education or PNE. These are these are sort of brands explain pain. They're brands, and and I think that establishes that we recognise there's a role. And that we recognise that uh, it's very helpful to do that kind of education for some people, even though, uh, as I've said before, we we haven't been very good at it. But all that education, I mean, I, I would interpret what you've said there, Ryan, as uh, the powerful hit in people's interaction with you that leads them to go and talk to other people is what they learnt from you about living, uh, and uh, and about health and about opportunity and about prognosis and all that and. So I actually think what, what people learn still remains the more powerful thing. So Lorimer, these are more quotes from you. <laughs> I felt uncomfortable Sunday with Peter Stilwell and Matt Lowe quoting them, but, but I'll let you talk about this. Advice to remain active makes no sense to someone in pain as long as their pain is a signal the tissue is damaged. To the person in pain, this advice is akin to saying, get over it and get moving. And back to this education question, it's universally recommended and simultaneously brushed over as though everyone knows what it is and how to do it. You want to magnify that a little bit? No, but they're good quotes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm happy to own those quotes. No, I don't think I need to magnify that anymore. I, I'm, what I am hearing whispering in the back of my mind is, uh, is just, just to be careful that, um, this, this pendulum of opinion uh, doesn't, and I saw one of the comments actually, and, and one of the comments came from uh, James who's in our research group, um, just reminding us that um, tissues do get damaged and tissues do get strained and inflamed. And, and uh, if we have sound reasoning behind identifying that they are making a, a contribution to 
the brain's desire to protect you and we can do something about it, we should. Uh, and uh, someone made the point that, uh, or, or argued that the treating diseases as entities has led modern medicine to massive gains. Uh, I, I don't fully endorse that, it, it, but I would just say it has, has, has allowed science, medical science to drive gains. But I think that George Engel's point of, um, you, you don't, a person comes to seeing the clinic, it's never the tissue or the, or the virus that turns up for treatment. It's the human. And that was George Engel's point, I think. The, the human turns up for treatment and that human is a biopsychosocial entity. And uh, I think that that, that idea of, uh, of the, the, the pendulum swinging so that, you know, those of us who are passionate about this complexity and patient or person-centered care and uh, learning and functionally appropriate gains and getting rid of low value care and all that, we can tend to get into our own bu bubble that gives gives pe people outside of the bubble the, uh, I think, misimpression that we think that tissue is irrelevant and we don't think that. And you've made that point. I think you quoted Mary O'Keefe about yeah. that. That's a really important point for us to remember because I'm sure, Ryan, that in your education, you are, you are also evaluating according to valid tests and good science uh, when there is a need to address a limitation in a tissue. Uh, and I, I don't think anyone will, what I know of everyone here uh, gathered, I know you better than others, Craig, but better than I know the others on the panel. Um, we, we would never say uh, the body's irrelevant. We would just say it's a complex system and contributions from the musculoskeletal and other systems mm. are potentially important. But let's stop the nonsense when the research tells us that, that it's nonsense. Uh, you know, some of these, these clinical reasoning tests that some of us relied on and thought, oh, that's so fantastic. I didn't realise that every single... Like, for me, when I was an early physio, I didn't realise that every single person I was seeing had overpronation. No wonder they got jaw pain. And then the, the research clearly shows that's a nonsense. And then we reject the, the diagnostic framework, you know. So I, I just want to make it clear that I, I speaking for me, and I'm, I'm sure you guys would resonate with this, that we're not, we're not saying remove all of the lovely science in, uh, that was based on biomedical understanding of things. But we have to incorporate it into a biopsychosocial model. That's my view. I love that. You didn't Absolutely. ask me to do that, but I just felt like that was something whispering. No, I, I think people start to uh, put things in, in certain lenses and then create these silos and, and dump some of these ideas into those silos, which is the opposite of what we really are saying. I think the whole idea of systems is a bit of a, of a misnomer. And uh, Dostoevsky talked about this. We'll talk about it with Rachel Balkovec on Sunday, but... Um, the point about complex systems is that it's hard to predict the future. And we just want to develop agile approaches so that um, we can um, meet people. And I think that's where the listening comes in, is really developing the trust through motivational interviewing or what have you, uh, to hear what people's valued life activities are, what their beliefs are about what they need and their expectations. And then we can begin the process of, of, of upskilling them perhaps but to your point i think a lot of it is we need to be upskilled so so we see again peter o'sullivan and jeremy lewis reframing for us it's arguable that musculoskeletal clinicians have invented treatments for conditions that may not exist and developed and perpetuated paradigms that don't conform to the current research evidence um, we have to be aware of the nocebos in our midst um, how we're also making people feel fragile um, by telling them they're out of alignment or they have tight muscles or uh, instability, uh, which are the functional terms, but also they're in many respects, not a lot better than the pathological terms such as degeneration or narrow spinal canal or nerve effacement. I wanna share a video from one of my telehealths this week. Uh, we've been doing this at each of the webinars. So this is ridiculous and I just started touching my toes. And I couldn't do it at first, and I just kept bobbing up and down, and it got looser and looser. And I realized what I needed to do was just a roundhouse. 
somebody else it'll be go for a brisk walk. Yeah. You know what? That's and that's maybe the answer. The answer is that there is no one size that fits all, but the one thing that's common to everybody's size is movement. You've got to do something, you know, it's like it's like the Tin Man in the, in the Wizard of Oz. He was standing there until somebody finally like started moving his arm. I mean, that's really what it's like. The analogy is you're rusty. Yeah. You're rusty and you need and rust rust being rusty doesn't necessarily mean you have to rust to the point where where, where you're brittle and you fall apart. You need to reverse no. the rust. You got it. Rest, rest, rest equals rust. Yeah, and I think that. Yeah, I think that that is. Um, yeah, that's my biggest. My biggest takeaway is to not be afraid of moving, and not be afraid of having a little pain. Because. Does not. So, uh, Lorimer, what do you what do you uh, think about when you hear that? I love it. Movement. movement. I mean, the the Norwegian Physio Association has been on this for ages. Movement is medicine. And I, and I think it's it's a great it's a great general motto. We've been talking a lot uh, here uh, about this this idea of of bio, biological systems having sweet spots, mm. and uh, the 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 structural integrity of our of our tissues has a sweet spot that you, you, it needs load to maintain its its strength and to improve its strength. It, need, it needs load. Without that, it will do what you do in space. It will just, I mean, that that whole bio, we call it bioplasticity. That whole bioplasticity thing just turns me on all the time. Like it's, it's just so, so amazing that we, our structure will adapt to whatever demands are put on it. So if we stop putting demands on it, it will, it, it will just get weaker and I mean, of course it will. And if we start putting demands on it, it will get stronger. And this, this is a dependable property. I mean, out, outside of very rare disease states, this is a dependable property. And I love what Ken Freundlich said there uh, when, he, when he talked about, um, you, you, you understand that, oh yeah, it hurts a bit, but it's, you, you just gotta move. And, and that reframing the idea of pain as, as what, and I think the evidence is very compelling for this, as a protective buffer and uh, that protects your tissues, keeps them safe, uh, then we can understand that if, if people understand that it's, it's safe to be in a bit of pain and mm. get an understanding of the size of their buffer, then they'll make different decisions about it. And I guess also if they understand tissues have sweet spots uh, and the sweet spot is never nothing uh never unless the the tissue is broken and and needs to not not have any load in it because it won't cope with that and it's a very unusual situation but after you know acute trauma i'm going to show a little more from from ken in a sec but um obviously people don't think in terms of uh they're sedentary and and their capacity is low they they keep going back to wanting something to fix them. I think uh, you're giving us some language. I like the metaphor of, of, of space and atrophy. We've been talking a lot about uh, the fact that uh, people are atrophying 8% uh, per decade, starting uh, with uh, the 40, their 40s, um, but that it's reversible due to the plasticity you refer to. In, in one study, it showed in people in their 70s, if they've had 20 years of deconditioning, just three months of twice a week resistance training as per the physical activity guidelines from the World Health Organization can reverse that. And that'll lower the risk for all the things Ryan was talking about from cancer to heart disease, uh, to dementia, uh, to falls. So it's not just about pain, really. It's, it's about much more than pain. Pain is, as Professor McGill said, the gift of injury because we can help upskill people to a new lifestyle and pain could be the thing that brings them to understanding that things are out of kilter like COVID is showing us. Um, uh, I love this from Megan Marie in Boston. We need to shift the perception uh, from one requiring clini clinician dependency to one of patient autonomy. One where, where you're the trusted resource, Alfred, guiding somebody uh, by the side um, uh, and uh, someone who's motivating people to help people to become more empowered. Uh, so they, 
we're giving them a checklist, this accountability issue. Uh, Ryan, I, I like how Megan uses the term accountability. Um, how are you using checklists and baselines to show people progress? Because to me, uh, people are paying us for us to make a difference. And you can't manage what you can't measure. You're big on making things really clear to people, communicating that. Um, how are you doing that at Reload? I think uh, what uh, Lormer was saying before was, was um, uh, the heart of it is, is that tissues have a sweet spot. And that sweet spot, um, we, you know, through the clinical audit process, which is, uh, to me, just a way to create buy-in or a vehicle for education is, uh, for example, I've used this in the past where it's uh, someone has knee pain with stairs. You have them do uh, a couple of stairs. They say, yep, that's the pain. And then you you show you use a, a couple of maybe hamstring or glute exercises that modifies the pain um, in that moment. Then we say, okay, so we know it's modifiable. It's education, but that's our marker. Every time you have a uh, painful activity or an exercise, um, we are we are accounting for. We are measuring uh, whether you can tolerate that now over time. And, uh, what I was just saying in the, in the, um, chat room is, is a realization I had from something Lormer said is that education is not just some sort of one shot intervention where you just, you know, you just like add it to something. It's you, you know, you, you start the education process by explaining these things, but just like kids learn over time, you need to hear it over and over again to understand it. And, um, activity modification and exercises are the context in which we uh, can reflect and unpack those things so that they can understand it. And what I'm seeing with you and Ken over time, uh, I saw him in person at LASS and then over each week over this webinar, I see his epiphanies. Those are the times that uh, you're so good at letting him unpack and realize and take in and reflect um, what he's experiencing. And I think that helps him become educated to, to believe what you're telling him to understand and put it into context his pain. And I think uh, that's, that's an opportunity we don't jump on enough. I've seen you in the middle of treatment to stop everything you're doing and say, just have, let that person have that epiphany. And I think um, when, when we do that, we see the other, um, the, the markers we go back to, the original knee pain with the stare, after that over time, they say, yeah, I don't feel that as much anymore. And that's, and that's how we measure, and that's how we know that education is starting to work. I love that, Ryan. And, and that's, I don't know what you call it, the white space or the third space. It's the empty space. Um, it's like with motivational interviewing, where we sit, listen, um, don't interrupt. And then um, at a certain point in an appropriate pause, we respond by trying to repeat what people said. And we ask then, uh, ask then, um, did I get it right? And then we ask, if they say we did, is there anything else? Are you sure? Um, in the visit, when we're training people, when there is that opportunity, uh, we wanna let it sink in. And, and the tendency is always to do more, sometimes we have to do less. Um, this is uh, another uh, new paper from, uh, JP Canero and his group use education to facilitate active management approaches, targeted exercise, physical activity, healthy lifestyle habits, um, and to reduce reliance on passive interventions. This is, this is what it's all about. So our third kind of challenge today, taking advantage of having you here, Laura Murr, we've talked about the problem of pathoanatomy and the problem of the yearning for a specific label, problem of people's expectations for passive care and a fix it approach. Uh, the, the almost the flip side of the coin. Uh, what if there's nothing on the scan and they see the doctor and the doctor says, we didn't find anything. And then of course, you know, the, the conclusion is that it's all in your head. Unfortunately, pain without demonstrable physical cause is viewed by clinicians with suspicion and patients are often stigmatized. I, I have a fit person. I talked about it last week who says, you know, I'm pretty fit. I see people out there that are running and I can't run and they're out of shape and I'm in shape. And you're telling me I need to get stronger, but I feel like I'm already strong. That's sort of also wrapped up in this is, is uh, how to find these levers um, uh, to help people understand it's a process and the sweet spot to your point, Larmer is different for everybody. But pain without a demonstrable physical cause, 
you know, I don't think our audience, but, but the majority of physicians out there, uh, they stigmatize patients. Um, and this, this obviously is a quote from Peter who's in the audience. A recurring complaint of patients with chronic pain is that their pain and associated suffering are not recognized by their providers. So it could be in a chiropractic setting where we keep cracking the back uh, and the person's like, hey, this is this a cough drop at short term or it could be physical therapy and they're explaining you have a muscle imbalance and a faulty movement pattern and the other person's not getting better and then we keep going back to, well, it's still off. Your psoas is still tight. Um, what, what does this trigger for you, uh, Lorimer? Yeah, it's a really important issue, isn't it? And we've all, we've all had, I'm sure, the, when we've tried to uh, very well-meaning attempt to legitimise the pain of someone who has no positive findings on our tests. And we get the, you know, we get that arms crossed posture, which, uh, which scientists call the fuck off posture, uh, because it's implying, you know, okay, I don't believe you. But I think these quotes really point to the shortcomings of, I mean, this might be a surprise. They, they point to the shortcomings of, of us as clinicians and our, our clinical paradigms. Um, I think one of the, one of the triggers for my own journey towards uh, really taking seriously this idea of transferring understanding of uh, contemporary pain science to someone challenged by pain. That, my own journey of that, you know, the broadly the explained pain journey that I went on uh, was, was triggered in part and in, in a large part by this observation that, uh, and, and it started with interviews that I did with um, graduates of pain management program this is one of the world's leading pain management programs and uh, i was doing interviews exit interviews and the probably the most common thing that came up was this reflection on on the program which was along the lines of uh, oh the the program's lovely the the physios are great the psychologist is really nice you know and oh i didn't andrew do do so well then stop and they'd think, I mean, it's not really for me because I have real pain. Uh, and they would spend the whole program thinking that everyone else in the program was only there because they thought they had pain when they did it. And there was this, this, this idea of uh, if you have no injury, you have no pain. And if I have pain, I must have an injury. Yeah, you know, that same vicious cycle. Uh, and then me realising that actually every time we, we are stuck for a a physical cause. I don't really like that, that phrasing too much because I think that well, everything happening inside us has some physicality about it. But yeah, if it was this um, structural pathology cause, it, the, the patients come in still expecting us either to legitimise their situation by pinning it on a tissue or to illegitimise it by not being able to find the tissue. And uh, I mean, the phrase, phrases that I would use a lot would be things to just to remind people in the course of the clinical interaction to look them deep in the eyes and say, yeah, but you've got horrible pain, right? Remind them, I know, I know it's true. I know it's true. And we've cleared this. So we have to work out what is causing, you know, what, what is contributing to your core, your pain? Because it's horrible, right? And keep reminding them, I believe you, I believe you, I believe you, you, you you're suffering and your pain. Uh, but at the same time, not give in to this temptation that we sort of touched on in other parts of this conversation. Uh, as though, look, the compassionate thing here is to make something up that makes them feel legitimised. Because we're just propagating the, the problem, we're kicking the, the can down the road. And, uh, yeah, I think, I really think that when, as a clinician, we get to that stage where it makes, it makes total sense to have pain with and without a demonstrable structural pathology it makes total sense the system says that if once we get that deep in our belly and uh, the belly of our clinical reasoning then i think we won't run into those problems as much because it will never be whispering in the back of our mind that uh, something's not legit here it just stops whispering in our mind and i think that that starts to be communicated and the more often that uh, people challenged by pain come across clinicians 
who are convinced deep in the belly of their nervous system that pain is a biopsychosocial feeling that emerges when the system's trying to protect tissue for a range of reasons and multiple contributors in a very complex biological system. Once that gets stuck deep in our bellies more and more, then the expectations that patients have uh, that they will either be legitimized with a structural pathology or, or disregarded for not having one. I think that expectation will shift. Uh, we are, I've run exercises with, with clinicians where we just imagine that the patient in front of us, the person in front of us is uh, searching for Rene Descartes in what you're saying. They're looking for Rene. And if they can't find Rene, they're looking for a reason to think that you're a dickhead and you don't care about them. And if they're just looking for those two things, how do you avoid them ever spotting them? And that's an interesting exercise to go through and to think about even in your clinical interactions, to think about, can I get through this next half hour or hour or in Wales, 15 minutes? Uh, can I get through that time without them being able to spot Rene Descartes uh, and without them being able to confirm the, the alternative that I'm, I don't care and I think they're faking it. Maybe this is what uh, I was catching in a prior conversation with you about the patients with a fixed mindset. It's that F off, arms folded. Yeah. Yeah, I think... I, uh, They're not fear avoided. I think that applies. On the yellow flags. No, no. I mean, we see elite athletes who are performing at the top of their game uh, who are challenged by pain and they've got beautiful bodies producing a massive talks for a long period of time. Uh, they, they, we tend to forget sometimes that they're actually humans. Uh, yeah. We have a question from Lisa in Vancouver. Ryan, you want to... Uh present the question to Lorimer, please. Yeah. Lorimer, how do you relay to the patient? Uh, oh, sorry, that was a different one. Uh, uh, sorry, give me one second, I lost it. So while we're waiting for Ryan, um, Let's continue here. Uh, uh, I got it. Sorry. Got it? Good. Yeah. Uh, hi, Lormer. Uh, just curious how your experience with your own shoulder issues, uh, love that article you wrote in Body and Mind, has or hasn't influenced your writing and research on chronic pain? Ryan, can you please do that again? Just as you started talking, I got the little sign on my screen saying your internet connection is unstable. <laughs> uh, uh, Okay, um, Professor Lorimer Mosley, how, how has your uh, experience with your own shoulder issues, um, based on the article you wrote in Body and Mind, uh, has or hasn't influenced your writing and research on chronic pain? Uh, yeah, it definitely has influenced my, my research and my writing and my thoughts on chronic pain. Um, I, I'm convinced that all of all of these things influence us. So the the question of you know has it influenced is an easy one. How it's influenced is a harder one. Um, uh, I think so. F most people listening won't won't have read that. I imagine. Um, so that was written for me uh, at a time. I think I think I did a couple of instalments uh, when I had had uh, I'd had I'd had some recurring shoulder pain since I fracture dislocated uh, my shoulder in my 20s and just you know, every now and then it comes back and then I'd, I'd have a, uh, a pretty reliable uh, routine of identifying contributors to why that might be back and modifying life a little bit uh, usually involved with uh, involving doing some fairly heavy musculoskeletal training on it and then, but the first of those posts was written when after four or five months, I wasn't, I wasn't making any ground and it was brutally painful and uh, very mechanically sensitive. Uh, that's the one thing that I really noticed. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's a long time since I wrote that. It's, I'm pretty sure that I've, uh, 
in that in that blog post, I would have been reflecting on the the reality that here I am. Uh, my job is is in many ways to to try to understand pain and uh, understand pain. You know, improve our understanding of pain in a way that improves our treatment of it. Uh, and that's my job. And yet the whisperings in my mind were very familiar to me because they were some of the things that I was challenged by when I heard them in people I was dealing with in, in clients. And I think that I was reflecting on that. Well, here I am, I'm seeing some catastrophizing. I'm seeing some, uh, the a structural pathology model wants to get in there. Right. And yet I knew I hadn't done anything different on this shoulder. I, I didn't have any reason to say I could have injured a tissue or, uh, but it was so mechanically sensitive uh, and I couldn't budge it with the normal stuff. And then the next blog post, I think was probably another four months later where I was seeing my sleep was disturbed. Uh, I was starting to get, I got a lot of requests from well-meaning clinicians. I'll come to Adelaide and I'll fix it for you. Uh, oh, so now you realise the pain isn't all in your head. Uh, I got trolled. Uh, I, the ways that that experience influenced me were not just from having shoulder pain that was very difficult to resolve, but they were from the, the response of my community and the response of people who have never met me. Uh, and I think I had a small, a very small window, very small window into the damage that we do to each other by making assumptions about other people. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure that contributed to my, my pain. My, my system had a better reason to protect itself because now I was getting attacked from clinicians, scientists and the general public. Not everyone was attacking me. I'm not play that. Um, so the, the influence I think was, uh, not just on my own understanding of how pain works, but it's my, my own understanding of how do we how do we change the conversation here? Why why did no one ask me? So from a biopsychosocial perspective, how are you making sense of this shoulder pain? That's a great question. No one gave me that question. Uh, no one uh, when I started in the second blog post saying, and you know, it's both shoulders that are hurting and I've got other joints hurting. No one suggested, yeah, reckon you should investigate some sort of polyarthropathy. And I thought, wow, I like, like these two communities of, see, it's got to be structure. See, it can't be structure. And, and neither of those communities, and, and I, uh, I'm not blameless in this either, was was considering the true complexity of the human where immune systems go crazy and stuff like that. So, so it has definitely influenced my journey. And one, one real way that it's influenced the operationalization of my understanding is that I have way more interest uh, in pain associated with uh, rheumatoid arthritis type conditions, here negative arthritis, uh, the role of the immune system in producing symptoms, the things that change in your immune system in different contexts. And I guess it's been part of a journey that for me now is, is buried deep in uh, how much of the things we've learned about pain we can apply to all the other protective feelings that we get. Uh, for example, fear, uh, breathlessness, mm -hmm dizziness, stiffness, pins and needles, uh, the need to go to the toilet, hunger, thirst, all of these things uh, are feelings that are produced, in my view, to uh, solve a predicted problem. Um, so it's, it has influence in many ways. And I, I'm, I imagine that answer was probably not what Lisa from Vancouver was, was expecting. Uh, for the record, uh, I'm, I'm pain-free and have been for several years. I occasionally get bouts of shoulder pain. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm taking drugs for that. Uh, I take a small dose of methotrexate uh, for a seronegative autoimmune polyarthropathy. 
uh, and the the amount of, of drugs that I take varies uh, over the years and it goes up and down and the extent to which it goes up and down reflect my biopsychosocial context for the record. Mm. I think we have another question here. Ryan, you want to share uh, the timeline question? Uh, yes. Uh, what kind of uh, advice can you give for a realistic time frame for people in chronic pain that will motivate and not discourage? Or how can that be framed? That's a lovely question. Uh, and it's a really hard question to answer. The, the, uh, I have no idea how long recovery will take for an individual. Uh, but what I think is a, is a position that's entirely justified based on scientific evidence is that recovery is much more possible than we used to think. Uh, I think the evidence supports that, both from a mechanistic perspective and from an empirical outcomes perspective. The way that I would pitch that would be along those lines to say uh, there's nothing that I know of that will be something that will quickly fix this. Although all of us have seen these apparently miracle cures. But let's presume you this is not going to be a miracle cure for you. If it is, great outcome. Uh, but the, the journey that you're, you're on a journey now, and this will be a journey. Uh, and if you stay on it, you will, all the evidence suggests you will improve. How much you improve and how long it takes will depend on, on so many things which is why constantly evaluating you know, your, your pain right now is not gonna be that helpful because we don't expect it to change very quickly. What we wanna concentrate on uh, is, it, are you getting closer to the life you wanna have? And if you keep making step by step, you know, it's like, I love, I love cycling metaphors, probably because I love cycling, but it's like, it's like climbing up a really, really big hill on a bike. Uh, that if you look up there, you think that's too far away. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make it. Uh, but on a bike, you can always turn the pedal over again. And if that's what you're thinking about and you know that I'm, I'm heading towards the life that I want, uh, and I'm utilizing the people around me to help me on that, uh, then you will keep moving. It might be really slow. You might, you might be one of those people that needs this, the extra granny wheel at the front on your bike so that you can pedal really slowly. But the, the challenge that we have is making sure that we give, just give people the skills to not fall off and then they, they can keep going. I love that one. Patience, persistence and courage. That's like Ken said, emotion. So life is like riding a bicycle. As long as you don't stop pedaling, you won't fall off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And what we can offer people is a, is a more friendly gearing on their bike, strategies of getting a more friendly gearing. Strategies of, of uh, yeah, getting them in their sweet spot. And when the gradient gets a bit easier, make sure they know how to change gears and they can start moving more quickly. And when the, when the gradient goes up a bit, make sure they still know how to back off on the gears, but still not fall off. You know, we've got people here from Indonesia and India, from South Africa, from Thailand. Uh, Nick Sams, big shout out to you. Uh, uh, Firmanash from Indonesia. Um, I want to just sort of close in the last couple minutes. Number one, the fact that your, your honesty and transparency comes forth so uh, vividly, Alorma, is just a joy. To answer that last question, which is another one of the burning questions, people want to know how long is it going to last? They want to know what the cause of their pain is. They want to know what we're going to do for them. We're going to, you know, want, they want to know what they have to do, what they should avoid. Um, you know, Judith Turner laid all those things out that people expect in the first visit. And you made a beautiful diagram of it with David Butler at the end of Explain Pain. Uh, and they all want to know about the crystal ball question. How long is it going to last? Um, and you said, I don't know. And I mean, that's, that's like Niels Bohr talking to Einstein. You know, the hardest thing is predicting the future. Einstein flipping out because, you know, what do you mean we can't predict where an electron is in space at any given moment in time? Uh, he couldn't handle the unpredictability. He refused to believe that. And he, his response to Niels Bohr was, God doesn't play dice with the universe. 
There has to be a predict predictive thing. And our patients want us to be able to sit on high and say, oh yeah, this is gonna take six weeks, or eight weeks, uh, three months. Um, and there you are <laughs> answering the question of the day. I don't know. <laughs> um, we have to be able to accept uncertainty is one of my take homes from, from today with you. I, I wanna show Ken again here. Um, and I think you'll, you'll appreciate this. A lot more, a lot more plum right now. That's pretty awesome. Do you feel less protective? What do you mean? What do you, mean? you feel less afraid of oh, your back? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, no question about it. I mean, that's, that's the key to the whole thing. So I don't, even when I was online this morning at Costco feeling the pain, I wasn't, I didn't for a minute think I was going to seize up to the point where I couldn't move. I just kept moving and a little pain. I tried a little bit of this. I just tried, tried high stepping pull like this, which was very hard this morning. But I'm not afraid of it because I don't, I don't, I think I'm past this. Mm. So he's not afraid of it. And uh, this issue of people being uh, fearful and protective uh, us focusing on what's wrong over on the illness side, I kind of feel like we're ready to pivot towards the positive coping things that maybe are in absence rather than the negative coping things that are all in full bore. Um, and uh, shifting the focus from finding the cause to the other side of the coin, uh, identifying uh, the positive things that they're lacking instead of instead of trying to be reactive to everything and fixing and correcting uh, why not look at uh, uh, sustainable factors look at resilience factors look at adaptive uh, things that 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 are diminished because they just keep chasing this solution timeline what are you gonna do to fix this what do i need to do a very um, a linear type of thinking. Uh, uh, low levels of protective factors such as optimism and acceptance are predictive and now are being brought into the fear avoidance belief model um, as opposed to just the emphasis on catastrophizing and uh, anxiety and fear avoidance beliefs and pain hypervigilance. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on, on these two different ways of approaching the problem, Lorimer? Yeah, love it. I love this idea of of actually our shifting our focus of our intervention for something. And it sounds to me like Ryan, this is what you do: uh, shifting our focus uh, from okay, let's get over this episode to let's let's improve. Uh, why don't you improve your resilience forevermore uh, by learning skills, learning a way of understanding your own systems uh, and your, who you are so that next time you hit uh, a perturbation, you, you're more resilient to it. I actually really enjoyed it. It's a long time ago since I've, since I've read it, but a book called Anti-Fragile, which I really resonated with, which was suggesting that uh, actually resilience is, is uh, not the high bar. You know, resilience is this, this idea of um, remaining stable in the midst of insult. The higher bar is being what, what this fellow, I can't remember his name, but Ryan, you nodded, you might remember his name, but the author who I think is an, an economist uh, uh, talks about, Khalid. there you go. Thank you. Um, you could throw that book around to people because I think it's well worth a read, but he talks about anti, anti fragility being a step above resilience so that actually our intervention shouldn't look to preserve the status that someone is in, it should look to improve it and give them skills to continually improve it. I love that. Uh, I think that's I think that's the next zone, and I think that actually going right back to the start two, two hours ago, uh, I think telehealth is giving us an opportunity to leave uh, or to promote within the people who see us strategies and skills and knowledge that will actually improve their life once the reason they came to see us is all over and the next challenge comes in i love it and i think this is the perfect segue to sunday we have rachel balkabeck who 
is in the Carol, Carol Dweck mode of growth mindset and uh, through developing failure tolerance, something she spoke with us about at Exos in Arizona. And she talks about fear of failure comes from lack of preparation and lack of preparation leads to inability to adapt. So to be able to handle uncertainty, we want to be able to first and foremost develop the keystone for growth mindset which is failure tolerance. And so she gets all of her athletes and she's in team sports with the New York Yankees. She gets all of her athletes. Uh, she's the first female uh, hitting coach in baseball, was the first female strength and conditioning coach. She's with the New York Yankees now. Um, uh, we're gonna be talking on Sunday, for those of you who, who are interested, about how uh, a culture uh, that focuses on failure tolerance as a positive trait uh, and as a keystone to the growth mindset uh, to develop these positive attributes that make us more resilient and help us to be able to cope with all the unpredictability, all the uncertainty, because we don't have all the answers. Um, um, Lorimer, um, I'll send you the, the, the video, uh, the link to uh, uh, Rachel's presentation. I think you'll, you'll enjoy it because um, uh, it's not at a good time for you. But, I want to thank you uh, so much. Uh, this is the first time we've used the entire two hours. We started probably four or five minutes late, so we're going one minute over. Um, uh, I know it's early in the morning for you in Adelaide. Um, it is absolutely a, a pleasure to, to learn from you and listen Thanks, to Craig. that with you. Thank you so, so much. I well, know right back at you. I mean, keep it up. You're doing great stuff and uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm, I'm really grateful for it. It's not that early here in Adelaide. And you've got to remember that we're a day ahead, which is sort of metaphorical for things in general, I guess. You're tomorrow. You're where we're going to be. That's right. You're, you represent the future for all of us. Long. I want to thank Aaron and oh. John, our students too. And Ryan, of course, my partner in crime uh, across the uh, United States and New York. And we hope that you're doing well, Ryan. Uh, we know there's a lot. Uh, in the city. Um, well, yeah. Well, yeah. August, if, if we're allowed in the country. <laughs> uh, thank you guys, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you so much.